Let's give our young people another great big, great big, great big, great big hand. We thank God for young Madison who made it her business of resurrecting uh, the youth dance ministry a couple of years ago. We thank God for her. And uh, when I saw him, I said, check out little man. The, the sisters were bringing him up. Amen. But he had his part down. He was in the back. He waited. He got back. He said, yeah. All right, little man. <laughs> uh, I love it. I love it. I love it. I am. Um, um, it's been a tough year. I don't think in our 18-year history we've suffered this many deaths within the church family in such a concentrated period of time. It's like a gut punch that keeps happening. And this particular week was particularly hard. Any of you who've watched some conversation with the pastor, you've seen me laughing and joking and hollering at Phil in the back of the room as uh, Johnny Carson had Ed McMahon, James Brown had Macy. Um, Phil was kind of like my hype buddy. And the men from uh, the... Um, What we call our men's group? Man pause. I had a Clarence moment there. <laughs> know that when, um, you know, when men get together, we, we, we don't edit things the same we do when women are there and we want to be polite. And when um, our facilitator had uh, Espinosa, when he, he, uh, cursed in his presentation to try and accentuate his point and and then he followed up by saying well we all just men here right and that was a moment Phil had been waiting for his whole <laughs> life he said, he, all I needed was a green light he came right behind it and dropped a couple of expletives like it had been pent up in him and he was just waiting to dump it I was <laughs> But that was Phil. Phil was a Phil was a for real brother. He was a, he was a for real brother. It was no pretense about Phil. And uh, Mother Wilkins, um, just uh, uh, last week, she was um, she said, "You've been all angry about the Israel thing. You need to say something about our people." I said, "Well, they're all our people." She said, "You know what I'm talking." About. So last week when I mentioned several spots around the world that was in trouble, that's because Mother Wilkins got on my case. And uh, she may have had that prosthetic leg, but she knew how to grab a hold of you and get you <laughs> when she wanted to say something to you. Um, and I do want to say I appreciate this church for the way you love your first lady. I appreciate that. Because I have been in churches where that wasn't the case. I think she's the most wonderful human being I've ever met. So I appreciate you for confirming that I'm not crazy, that I'm right in my estimation. So give your first lady another big hand. because Sometimes she gets to you before I get to you. She is an unofficial co-pastor of this church. Don't, don't you? Amen. We never forget Marianne Ramirez, who Marianne had had history in the gangs and so forth. We hired her here, and um, Marianne never left home without her nine o'clock. And she'd tell me, Pastor, I got your back. You know, you've been there for me. And Sheila was my assistant, executive assistant, for a period of five years before she moved on. And uh, she and I were 
having a, an exchange. You know, husbands and wives do disagreed on something. And um, I guess the volume level went up and Marianne heard it down the hall. Marianne came in the office where we were and stood next to Sheila <laughs> with a hand by her nine o'clock looked at me and said is everything okay <laughs> I said wow it's like that I hired you but it's like that <laughs> Andrew I got it I got it <laughs> these women gonna stick together <laughs> yeah 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 so I know everybody loved the first lady and you should and uh, but it is Mother's Day, and uh, my mother's still with me. Thank God, Sheila's mother's still with her. But we both had grandmothers we loved, and so we celebrate all of our mothers, grandmothers, big mamas, aunties that have been are with us and have gone on before. Amen. Um, it was the Spinners who did the ultimate tribute, I think, to departed mothers and grandmothers. Uh, when they said, early one Sunday morning, breakfast was on the table. There was no time to eat. She said to me, boy, hurry to Sunday school. Filled with the Lord of glory. We learn the holy story. She always held her dreams despite the things this troubled world could bring. Oh, say yeah, you know it. Don't you know no, we love you, sweet say that? There's no one above you, sweet Satan, living in the past. Sweeter than cotton candy, yes she was. Stronger than Papa's old brandy. And always that needed smile. Once in a while, she would break down and cry. She always seemed so happy, yes she did. Being with us and daddy, she stood the test of time, breaking the binds. With just a simple song Oh, say that Don't you know we love you, sweet Say that There's no one above you, sweet Say that God is living in the past Sweet say that we're my old schoolers. There's no one above you, sweet say that we are living in the past. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One more time, say that. Don't you know we love you, sweet say that? Oh, there's no one above you, sweet say that. Are living in the past. Thank you to the band. I know I stress y'all out sometimes when I just jump out there, but I've been doing this for 36 years. Amen. <laughs> Father, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be made acceptable in thy sight. O oh God, you are our strength and our redeemer. Bless us now, God, in this preaching moment for your glory. Bless us now in this preaching moment for your glory. We offer it to you, Lord, as a sacrifice of praise. 
and let your word go forth, never ever to come back void and accomplish the purpose for which it is sent. In the name of Christ, we pray and give thanks. Let us all say together, amen. Man, I do want to say that, you know, I wore my sandals today because it fit my African outfit. So my toes are out. So before I get done, can the audio video people, can you get a close up on my toes? <laughs> the Bible says, oh, how beautiful are the feet of him that bring you good tidings and publishes peace. I did clip my nails this morning before I left. And uh, you can barely see the fungus I- anymore. So. So before I sit down, do a close-up so I can bless the people of God. (laughs) This morning, rather than reading a scripture to you, and I'm going to read some. This is typical. This is by... A genre. This is a topical sermon. But I want to start with a reading that a wise sage, namely Norman Braxton Sr., uh, turned me on to a while back. And I, I, I want to read that for you uh, at this time. In fact, hand me my phone. I left it over there. Thank you to uh, Vanna Black, who's been receiving flowers and running things around with me. It is a song, a poem by Cahil Gibran, entitled On Children. And a woman who held a babe against her bosom said, Speak to us of children. Your children are not your children. They are the sons and the daughters of life's longing for itself. They come through you, but not from you. And though they are with you, yet they belong not to you. You may give them your love, but not your thoughts, for they have their own thoughts. You may house their bodies, but not their souls. For their souls dwell in the house of tomorrow, which you cannot visit, nor not even in your dreams. You may strive to be like them, but seek not to make them like you. For life goes not backward, nor tarries with yesterday. You are the bows from which your children as living arrows are sent forth. The archer sees the mark upon the path of the infinite, and he bends you with his might that his arrows may go swift and far. Let your bending in the archer's hand be for gladness, for even as he loves the arrow that flies, so he loves also the bow that is stable. My subject this morning is the stable bow. The stable bow, the words of Cahill Gibran, a Lebanese American, born 1883, died 1931 at the age of 48 of tuberculosis. He was a Moranic Christian, was also influenced heavily by Islam. He was Arab. Um, it's a compelling poem because it presents God as the archer and children as arrows and the parent as the bow between the archer and the arrows. It plays on the understanding of the hearer that The purposes of the archer are fulfilled only when the arrow hits the archer's mark. Whether that arrow is aimed at food or foe, for preservation or for defense, 
They are flung in the direction consistent with the archer's will, fulfilled through the arrows landing at the archer's mark. But between the archer and the arrow is the bow. Woe to the archer when he put the arrow in the bow and the string popped. And the arrow went misdirected. Or that the bow itself suffering dry rot broke under the pressure of the pulled string. In either instance, if the bow is not stable, it cannot hold support and ultimately fling the arrow to hit the mark determined by the archer. Cabril wants us to know that he, God who is the archer loves the arrow but also loves the bow because if the bow is not stable there is no chance that any of the arrows will hit their mark. If you remember nothing else about this sermon, remember this, because this is really a conversation with parents, and heavily emphasis upon conversation with uh, parents with adult children, but I want to get there. A parent's work is never done. Can I get a witness? <laughs> we don't retire. Our term does not end when they turn 18 graduate from college, we're parents for life. Uh, They may leave your house, hopefully, prayerfully. (laughs) They may leave when they leave your house. They may or may not have left your wallet. (laughs) Typically, they have not. Some do sooner than others. But even if they leave your house and leave your wallet, they never leave your heart. And they never leave your sphere of concern. Parenting is a lifelong job that expires only when death does do part, unless in the providence of life we ourselves mentally decline before we physically decline and we enter a second childhood and then they have to take care of us. And uh, I've told Chris and Sam that they are for me my uh, long-term care insurance. I told him it's in the will that if you put me in a home, you get nothing from my (laughs) estate. I took care of you, and you couldn't take care of yourself, so I expect the same in in return. And um, I said, I don't care how honorary or difficult I become. You once had colic, and I didn't go nowhere, so... (laughs) I know Carissa, since she tends to be impatient and heavy-handed, I said, I expect to be in your house, and I expect to be treated right. (laughs) I said, and if you don't, I'm going to wait till you have a dinner party with important people at your house. (laughs) And then I'm going to come out of my room wearing nothing but my adult diaper. (laughs) And I'm going to shout out to your guest, she beats me. (laughs) That's what I'm going to do, Brother Todd, yes. Yeah. But the job is never done. They, they may leave your home and, leave your wa- and may leave your wallet, but they never leave your heart or your sphere or of concern. It is a lifelong job. In the first instance, when our children are, in fact, children, when they are minors, I know no matter how old they get, um, to us, they are our children, but they're not always a child. I looked at the video from last week, Singing with Carissa, and I referred to her as baby girl in the song. And, and I've been calling her that her whole life. Uh, in middle school, she objected to me saying it in front of her friends, but, you know, that's, that's her name, Carissa's second. I think baby girl's on her birth certificate. <laughs> and... Uh, but they're, they, they're always our children, but they're not always a child. As a child in the state of dependency, when we stand between them 
and starvation. Yes, we produce them and we have to protect them and, uh, and we have to love them, assuming all that, and those are not small assumptions. But for the sake of argument, assuming that's all in place, I want to take aim at the fact that in their childhood, our obligation is to instruct them. As a child, when they in fact are a child, not an adult, but as a child, our job, our duty is to instruct them, or to say in other words, to train them. Proverbs 20, 26 says, train up a child in the way that they should go. When they get old, they will not depart. He seems to speak in the absolute, says they will not depart. It says that they, uh, not that they won't depart, because we know too many children who were raised right and went wrong. But the fact that if you're concerned about what they do on that, uh, in terms of the outcome, you have to look at the input, because if there's not the right input, there certainly will not be the right outcome. Train them up in a way that they should go. Now, what they ultimately do is between them and the Lord and the law. <laughs> and, and, and we train them to train them, distinct from education. Training is distinct from education. Benjamin E. Mays used to say the difference between a man and a beast is the level of the training. And I've seen humans who masquerade seemingly by design or default as beasts because no one bothered to train them. No one bothered to train them on how to dress, how not to dress for certain occasions, how to speak, how to represent themselves rightly. No one was saying, no, I don't know what you're saying because you're not enunciating or speaking clearly. You speak in white. If speaking right is speaking white, then what's speaking black? To learn how to speak in a way in which you command respect. Frederick Douglass said that in a literate society, a man or a woman is judged, their intelligence is judged by the proficiency they have in communicating both in written form and orally. And in a white supremacist society where black inferiority was assumed by a white audience, he said he felt within the first 15 seconds after he opened his mouth, he would debunk their every myth of black inferiority by the way in which he facilitated the king's English. Train them. Train them on how to make a bed so you can bounce a quarter on it. Train them on how to clean a house, how to polish wood, how to wax a floor, how to wash dishes. As pastor, I get called into a lot of houses. People want to come and bless the new house, and I have to go and bless the mess. Because they've been educated well enough to get a good job to command a high salary to buy a house that they don't know how to clean. I knew of a young woman who was near in her 40s, and her mother was a gourmet cook. And this young woman couldn't boil water, couldn't book a pot of rice, couldn't make gravy from scratch, didn't know how to bake, fry, uh, or broil chicken. How sad to come from the home of a gourmet cook, and you don't know what to do in the kitchen. The only thing you know how to make is a reservation. You're reduced to fast food, DoorDash, and Grubhub. And you cannot blame the young lady. You cannot blame the child because people don't raise themselves. That's the parent's fault for not making a point of bringing that child along and making that child stand beside mother in the kitchen and learn how. Learn how to cook, learn how to iron, learn how to wash clothes, to separate the dark clothes from the, from the, from the white clothes and the dark, dark clothes from the high-colored clothes and the synthetics from the cotton and all those management types of things. Train them. Train them on, on, on how to present themselves in public, how to talk to a potential Employer, I was sitting in an office once at Bison Stadium in Buffalo with a minor league team meeting with the general manager, uh, Michael Bellani, who was one of my classmates in, 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 in Leadership Buffalo class of 1991. And two young African-American men came in to try and get a job. They wanted a job for part of the ground crew. And they came in uh, wearing the shower cap looking thing that for those who had a, 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 a jerry curl was trying to moisturize. They showed up at the sight of a potential, a potential employer 
wearing their moisturizing cap, with their pants hanging down, with their britches showing, shoestrings untied, chewing their fingers, and ask the lady, can I get an application? An application. And they sat there asking each other as they were trying to fill it out. And I know they were asking each other, each other, do you know what this word is? And I watched the lady toss it into the garbage can. Not necessarily because she was racist. I wouldn't have hired him either. Train. Train up a child in the way that they should go. We instruct them and we train them by precept and example. Precept, example. Somebody say precept example. Precept is the, is the rule, the, the, the instruction, the value, but example is when you embody it. If you remember nothing else about this sermon, remember this. Precept means nothing if it's not confirmed in example. Because people learn what they live. It doesn't matter what you say to a child. If you contradict it in what you do, what they will internalize and learn is what they see. You can tell a child to make up their bed, but if you don't make up yours, you have taught them to leave their bed undone. My grandfather used to come into the room all the time when we were all together and making noise, and he'd come in and start screaming, why in the so-and-so is y'all making all this noise? I can't stand all this noise. (laughs) But you the one that taught us how to communicate like this. He despised seeing himself in us. You can't shout at people that they should lower their voices. Huh? When Carissa got older, she was a clutter bunny. I used to call her Katrina because when I looked at her room, it looked like Hurricane Katrina had come through, (laughs) starting with her unmade bed. I was raised to make up my bed. As an adult, I decided I was tired of making up my bed. And as I fussed at her about making up the bed, Sheila said, well, maybe it would help if you start making up yours. (laughs) And so to get her to make up her bed, um, and I haven't been at her house lately, so I don't know if she is or is not, I had to start making up mine again. We have to begin training our children, and training a child is not putting a cell phone in their hand to preoccupy them while you go do other things that you think are more important. In the child, we instruct them. That's really all I want to say about that. As a child, we instruct them. But I do want to play a video just because it gives me some grandfather bragging pleasure. Can you play that? Video. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> my grand. Try it again. Let's try it again. So it's Iran again too. Okay. You wanna watch me? Right. Woo! Woo! <laughs> <laughs> Take much, does it? No, no. That's when you realize okay. all the toys and stuff you buy kids, and Woo. it really don't take much. Woo. We got all that crap for Jair, and it would be one little stupid something that he actually played with. Please excuse my sister's fussing in the background. I already told you about my grandfather. <laughs> but I was, I was, I was, I was. Showing my grandson basically how to throw a ball in the air, enjoying some time with him, and he was emulating. This is my point here. Children emulate. Monkey see, monkey do. They emulate what's put in front of It's no accident when a boy walks like his father or mimics his, learns his facial expressions or the girl turns and makes gestures that her mother used to make. They emulate. It doesn't matter what you say to that child. They're going to learn what they live and they go, as Langston Hughes says, one becomes what one beholds. You have to be the value that they want them to learn because they are going to become you in time. Amen? That's all I want to say about that because I really want to talk uh, for just for the few moments I have left so, uh, uh, about parenting adult 
children. How many of you know that once your children become adults, your job ain't done? Ain't no retirement. News flash. Ain't no retirement. The job just shifts. In fact, I think it gets more complicated. Because you don't have the levers of control you had when they were young. And in adulthood, we do two things. We consult and we cover. This is very practical. This is a conversation this morning. We consult and we cover. And by consult, I mean we remind and reiterate what we instructed them when they were children. Let me say that again so you can wrap your mind around it. When our children grow up, and they are our children, but they are no longer a child, we remind and we reiterate what we instructed them when they were a child. Go home and read Proverbs, the first chapter, the seventh through the tenth, or the seventh through the ninth verse, where it's, it, it, it has that seminal passage that we all know. It says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and a fool despises wisdom. Is, or the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. A fool despises wisdom and instruction. Instruction. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. A fool despises wisdom and instruction. Instruction. And then it goes on to say, my son. He says, hear the instruction of your father and do not forsake the law of your mother. Read it when you go home. It says that you wear them like the crown of grace and wear them like a chain around your neck. Not an instrument of oppression, but literally is jewelry. Your bling bling is your mother's law, your father's instruction. This is a statement of a father to a grown child saying to them when they're grown, hear the instruction of your father. What I taught you as a child, do not forsake your mother's law. You forsake something that you knew had, had a grasp on and left it alone. Do not abandon your mother's law and your wisdom. It is like a crown of grace on your head. And it's like, the, it's like the accessories to your outfit. Wear it. Your mother's instruction, do not forsake it. Because when our children are grown, you can't tell them what to do. You ought not try to guilt them into doing things you can't demand. You don't have the levers of power. You can't say, this is my house once they've moved out your house. All you can do is consult to remind them of what you taught them when they were children. And the thing we always have to remember when we're dealing with our grown children, you cannot raise grown children. You cannot raise adults. That job is done, right or wrong. If you didn't raise them when they were a child, you're certainly not going to raise them when they are grown. The only thing you can do is consult. And that has to be done gently. Amen. If you try and make a grown child do something, they, even though you may think you know better than them, the only thing you do is cause them to shut you down and shut you out, and now they're deprived what is potentially their greatest source of wisdom and stability. They still need you even if they don't know it. Amen. But if you're too heavy-handed or too overbearing, they will shut you out because now the fight is over control. Now you've made the issue them showing you that they are grown. And you need to recognize that they are grown. This is not a chance for you to continue raising them. All you can do at best is reiterate and remind them of what you hopefully instructed them when they were a child. Say it quick and fast and keep it pushing. Have I got a witness? Because they heard you. So my mom used to tell me, you hear me? I've heard Sheila say to Chris, you hear me? They hear you even though they're arguing with you. They're just trying to prove to you they grown, but they hear you. And that's all you can do is say something and keeping it 
pushing because if you try to push too hard, they'll shut you down, shut you out, and then they lose. They, 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 they lose their greatest source of wisdom and instruction. And we as parents of adult children, we must consider every now and then when we look and see that uh, we don't necessarily agree with their, 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 their romantic interests, their, their friends, their, their job choices, we don't necessarily, their living arrangements, and we don't agree, and, and we feel that somehow or another we're going to make them conform to our will, we ought to consider every now and then we may be wrong. They may be right. When this child over here, uh, 26 years old and wanted to buy a house, she'd come home from college and lived with us and we didn't need her money to pay our rent. We said, well, we, we're not going to have no delayed adolescence. So if you're going to live in our house, what you're going to do is put in the bank verifiably every month what you would be paying in rent and utilities so that this is going somewhere. You can put money away for grad school or to buy a home one day, and so you can be ready to be a homeowner. With 26 years of age, she said, I want to buy a house. I said, well, no, you need to go to grad school. So we're in a disagreement whether she need to buy a house or get a grad or go to grad school. I said, you're a woman, and, uh, and, and, you know, babies come along and get married. That disrupts the life. You need, to, you need to go ahead and get grad school done while you're younger because then you don't know what life is going to kick at you and it's different for a woman than a man because women get stuck with all the child care and I ran down all my thing in the, in the parent protocol. <laughs> but this child being stubborn and so forth, she took after her mother that she decided that <laughs> she wanted a house and uh, make a long story short, after she and had people look at it, so she brought me over and she brought a condo and looked at the house and she said, Dad, how'd I do? And I had to admit, because it was a condo, she didn't have to do yard care. She didn't have to replace no roof. All she was responsible for the four walls inside. It was a responsibility that she could handle. She had saved her money, could do the down payment. I added to it. She went in at 20%, didn't have to pay the PMR or PMI, which made the note sustainable. And I said, well, baby girl, you did pretty good. You did pretty good. I had to admit she was right. And I was wrong. And sometimes we as parents of adult children need to be willing to admit for all the more longer time we've been on this planet, that doesn't mean we're right. And sometimes we have to admit we may be wrong. And they may actually be right. Not most of the time, but every now and then. <laughs> we consult. Stay in the picture. But there's another part of this, and uh, where I really want to go today, and that is parents of adult children, we cover. We cover. And, and when I cover, I mean as parents, we function as prayer intercessors Amen. for our children. In Romans 8 and 34, put that up there. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Paul paints a picture of the risen Christ who has returned to the glory that he divested himself from when he came down through 40 and two generations to be manger born and cross crucified for our redemption. And now that same Christ has ascended back to the Father until Gabriel blows his trumpet to announce his, his second advent and his fast return. And until then, he sits at the right hand of the Father. And it says that he intercedes for us, which means that every now and then the Lord sees us struggling and leans over and says, Father, give him more grace. And Paul paints a picture of Christ interceding for us. And Christ says to us, follow me. 
And one of the things we don't emphasize enough in, in, in looking at the Lord's journey here on earth, because we like to focus on the sensationalism of his miracles of providing fish and loaves and walking on water and, and healing lepers and making the, the paralyzed rise up and walk and giving sight to blind eyes. We like all of that, but don't forget the fact that was most constant in Jesus' life is Jesus was a man of prayer. His public ministry began when he was baptized and the Holy Spirit drove him out into the wilderness of 40 days of fasting and prayer. Mark tells us in the first chapter, 33rd and 34th verse, read it when you go home, that Jesus' daily ritual he says that when, 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 when the day ended, it says all people was at his door. And it says that the next day, it says, and everyone was at his door. But in between these two episodes of madness, it says, and a great while before day, he got up, departed to a lonely place, and there prayed. It was our Lord's practice that before I deal with them and all their issues, I spend time with him. Jesus was a man of prayer. If when God became man and had to deal with man, God could not deal with man without first dealing with his father to fill him up so that he could go out and deal with the people who are going to pour him out. Jesus was a man of prayer. And if God could not handle the burdens of humanity and service, then how without praying to his father first, how much more must we be people of prayer to be need to be filled up by God, who is an infinite fountain of redemption's blood and grace and mercy. So that when we deal with them, starting with our own children to certainly be poured out, how much more do we need to be perpetually being filled up so that we have something to pour out? And then filled up so we have something to be poured out. And then filled up so we have something to be poured out. Jesus was a man of prayer. Not only was a man of prayer, he was constantly praying for his disciples. We talk about the Lord's Prayer as if it happened in John uh, or in, 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 in Matthew 6 where he says, give us this day our daily bread. That was a template on the movements of prayer, salutation, submission, uh, petition, salutation. These are the things that need to be included in prayer. Talk to God like you know you're talking to God. Our Father which art in heaven, holy is thy name. Submit to God, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Then you can do your petition, starting with the, the physical things. Give us this day our daily bread, but don't forget the spiritual things. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And Lord, lead us not into temptation, but when we get in trouble, deliver us from evil. And then submit yourself again on the outgoing, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. When you pray, talk to God like you know you're talking to God. And then, then, then submit yourself to God. Then ask of God what you think you need. And then say at the end, not my will, but thy will be done. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. That's just showing you how to pray. But the actual Lord's prayer was in John 17 when he prays for the church. When he says, let them all be one. And as you have sent me, so also do I send them. And as I was with you, let them stay connected to me. And that is the prayer over the church. Jesus prays. He intercedes for the church while they are fussing and fighting. And James and John are trying to cut deals for power. Peter is promising to go with him into prison and into death, but he denies him three times. Judas is betraying him. And the others are going underground while they are shattering and scattering and falling down and disappointing. The Lord is praying to his father on behalf of his disciples. And if you think your children Children are falling and faltering and making false steps and falling down. You don't need to berate them with advice that they didn't ask for. Sometimes you just need to go and have a little talk with Jesus. On their behalf and say, Father, give them more grace. There are two things that happens when we cover our children that we've instructed and still counsel. They need our covering. They need our, their names constantly in our mouths before God. Prayer is a work, a work that you must be faithful to. We labor in prayer. In seasons of distress and grief, my soul has often found relief. And oft escaped the tempter's stare by thy return. 
Sweet hour of prayer. Long after you stop feeding them and clothing them and housing them and paying their bills, that your, our children still need us to pray over them and cover them. Because prayer does two things. I say this, I'm going to let you get to brunch. That's why we had the offering early, because when I opened up the doors of the church, y'all ain't walking out with the offering. <laughs> I got three official degrees. I got four unofficial ones. That's in Negroology. I got a PhD. <laughs> When prayer changes things for them, I can't tell you exactly how it works because you're dealing in the metaphysical. But the Bible tells me, Beverly, that the faithful, fervent prayers of the righteous, not perfect, righteous, people in right ordered relationship with God, that it availeth much. Amen. Prayer literally changes God. We are not, we are not connected to an abstract God removed from the daily events of our lives. God changes things. I like the way William Cullen Bryant said, truth forever on the scaffold, wrong forever on the throne. Yet that scaffold sways the future and behind the dim unknown standeth God within the shadows, keeping watch above his own. But the God who standeth within the shadows, sometimes every now and then when we need him and when somebody prays, and says, Father, give my child more grace. God will step from behind the shadows and handle it. There's some situations that are best handled if you give it to God. Psalm 32, 8, I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way that thou shalt go. I will guide thee with mine eye. God can handle it. There's nothing that will happen in the life of your child or yours that God cannot handle. I remember when I was 22 years of age and a bit strong-willed myself. And I wanted to drive my Datsun 610 piece of car that had no air conditioning. And I wanted to drive it from Tacoma down to San Antonio, Texas, where my sister Felicia was at Lackland Air Force Base. And then on up to Rochester, a, 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 a journey of 4,200 miles. I had no credit cards. I had no AAA. I had a $300 check I cashed, filled the tank up for $20, and I had $280 cash for everything to get from Tacoma down to Lackland Air Force Base up to Rochester, New York. I had a cooler with some ice and some sodas and some lunch meat, a hibachi where I was going to cook. I was going to sleep at the KOA campsites. I was going to sleep during the day. I was going to drive at night. That was my plan because since I didn't have an air conditioner and it was 100 degrees across the country, I was going to drive at night, which would be counted on my biological clock, and I was going to sleep during the day. Well, I very early learned, because I took Heather with me to drop her off at Lackland Air Force Base, and somewhere up in the Rockies, we found out my plan was flawed because we didn't know that the tent served as a roaster bag during the day. <laughs> when the sun hit it. And after the first night of, of, of Heather and I being rotisserie negro, <laughs> that plan, plus we were eaten up by mosquitoes, <laughs> did not work. So after two days of no sleep somewhere up in the Rockies, in the wee hours of the morning trying to drive, I fell asleep at the wheel. And my mother had begged the pastor, Floyd D. Bullock, please talk him out of this journey. And he said, all his life, y'all been telling him the Lord will make a way. And now he's putting it to the test and you want me to dash his hopes. If you want to tell him, after all, that the Lord can't open doors, then what will he preach? Let him go. Pray for him. And so I had my trip tick. You all Google trip tick when you get home. I had my trip tick across the country, $280, a hibachi. And, 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 a, and a cooler. My plan was flawed. Somewhere in the wee hours of, of the night watch, I fell asleep at the wheel until the car jolted. And it woke me up. 
And I was within yards of going off a cliff that plummeted hundreds of feet below in the Rockies. A certain death for me and my little sister Heather. But a stone, I stopped and looked, a stone in the road woke me up. You didn't hear what I said. A, a, a stone in the road. The stone, I believe it wasn't any stone. I believe it was the stone that the builders rejected. <laughs> that God made the headstone of the corner. The rock of ages that clefts for me. The, the, the rock has a way of showing up. Somebody said in the song, when I get in trouble, I go to the rock. The rock can wake you up before you hurt yourself. The rock can get you through rehab. The, 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 the rock can get you out of a dysfunctional relationship. The rock can take the taste of liquor out your mouth, no matter what the issue is, if you go to the rock. And I believe that I, that I hit that rock because my mother's prayers bounced off the satellite of the grace, found me somewhere up in the Rockies, pulled a stone down from the mountains just enough to jolt my car and wake me up because God can open doors. God for you. It's more than the world against you. That's why today when I sing that song, somebody prayed for me. Had me on the mind, took the time and prayed for me. I'd have perished somewhere up in the Rockies if my mama hadn't been praying me all the way across country. Pray for your children. They may be close to danger, but God has a way of shaking them just in time. How many of you are here today because somebody prayed for you enough to where just in time, just in time, just in time, God shook you and you came to yourself and here you are, not because you ain't never been in harm's way, but God got to you. He may not come when you want him, but all just in time. Touch your neighbor and say, just in time. He got to me, just in time, just in time, just in time. Prayer changes things. Even when they groan, cover them, cover them, cover them, cover them. Don't fuss with them, you just make them close the door and you need to be in the conversation. Hit it, quit it, move it, hit quick and fast, but pray for them. If something's bothering you, pray for them. I don't know how it works, but we unleash the Holy Spirit into their life and their circumstances. And when God gets involved in their thinking, when, when God, you know, I think old man prodigal simply, he didn't chase that boy down the road. He and sister prodigal just went to praying and it bounced off the satellite of grace and down in that pigsty it said, and he came to himself. Keep praying till they come to themselves. Keep praying till they have sense enough to say, there are servants in my father's house living better than me. I can do better in this yeah. somebody prayed for me yeah. but prayer did not only change things for them and thank God it does prayer changes you yeah. listen strongest love you'll ever have in life is for your children I'm gonna say this and it may upset some but it's true and you know it's true uh the strongest love we ever have is for our children, not even for our spouse. How do I know? We'll leave the spouse for the sake of the children if we feel we need to. Huh? But we ain't going to abandon the children to stick with the spouse. And those who do, we don't respect them. There was a woman in my church in Buffalo. She had six children all farmed out to their fathers. She calls herself an evangelist now, and uh, no one takes her ministry serious because they said, don't tell me you know God if you brought six children in this world that you have no inkling to try and raise. They're all with their several daddies. And, uh, and they say, what kind of woman? We ask different questions for women than we do with men. What kind of woman could have all those children not have a maternal instinct to raise them? Every mother's not a good mother. Let's not act like an every father's not a bad father. And, uh, and she had all these children, farmed it out to the fathers. 
And, 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 and here, we talk about how with prayer changes things, the strongest love we have is for our children because we'll flee with the children to leave a spouse or a partner a co-parent that we think is a threat and a danger. But you ain't gonna leave and abandon those children. Have I got a witness? Or oh, if I was a threat, Sheila would have left me to protect Sam and Carissa. She would have never abandoned Sam and Carissa to be with me. Say amen, Sheila. Uh-huh. God has written it on the biology of us for the preservation of the species. You'll jump in front of a car if you're any kind of parent to be spoken of. You'll jump in front of a car to protect your children. If your child is sick, you'll stand no more at night praying, Lord, put it in my body. I've had a few years, but let them be okay. Now, I don't mind telling you this morning, if, if, if people ask me how I'm doing, listen, listen, if Carissa's okay, if Sam's okay, and even if Ramon's okay, I'm okay. Sheila's okay. I don't care how sick I am, pains, whatever, if Chris is okay, if Sam's okay, if Ramon's okay, I'm okay. If death sneaks around a corner tomorrow and takes me, I've had a few years and I'll go to my grave saying, God has smiled on me. But if Carissa's not okay, if Sam's not okay, if Ramon's not okay, I can't sleep at night. I got headaches, I got back problems, I got pinched nerves, I got digestive disorders, I got memory loss. Come on, somebody. Be, be, because it gets in your body. We obsess over, have I got two, three witnesses up here? When your children are okay, you okay. When your children are in crisis, you in more crisis than them. You more worried about it than they worried about it. But Jesus asked the question, how many of you can add one cubit to your stature or one day to your life by worrying. Worrying is just a tax on an already costly situation. And I come to tell you, you ain't doing nobody no good by worrying over your children. I'm preaching to you, but I'm preaching to me. You ain't doing nobody no good by staying up all night worrying about them children. Instead of staying up worrying, slide to the edge of your bed. Get down on your knees and say, Father, I stretch my hand to thee. Father, give them more grace. Father, protect them from themselves. Father, they're not mine anyway. They're your children. I'm just the bow. Lord, Father, give me the strength to be a stable bow. Oh, Lord, Father, give me the strength to be patient like a stable bow. Father, give me the strength to hope against hope like a stable Bow. Father, give me the strength to hold my peace, to know what I should say and what I should keep to myself because I want to be a stable bow. Father, give me the faith to know that you may not come when I want you, but you will step in right on time. Have I got a witness? Hey, hey, hey. Prayer is not to be taken taken lightly. Prayer moves mountains. Prayer divides red seas. Prayer drowned Pharaoh's chariots. Prayer took the bite out of a lion in the lion's den. Prayer kept Shadrach, Meshach, and a bad Negro. Prayer was Daniel Stone rolling. Hey, 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 prayer was Solomon's uh, Rosa Chariot. Uh, prayer was Ezekiel's wheel in the wheel of a wheel. Prayer is a bridge over troubled waters. Uh, prayer is a rock in the middle of a road. Prayer will bring down your blood pressure. Prayer will help you get some sleep at night. Uh, prayer will remind you that God still got it in the palm of his hand. Hey, 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 hey. Prayer reminds you that ultimately
ultimately it ain't up to you it's up to God who leads us in paths of righteousness for his name's sake for God's own sake God's gonna bless them for God's own sake God gonna save them from themselves for God's own sake God will shake them when he gets ready for God's own sake he'll bring the prodigal home for God's own sake he'll be better to them than you can be to them for God's own sake touch your neighbor and say neighbor for God's own sake he will work it out say yeah I said for God's own sake he will work it out oh y'all didn't hear me I said for God's own sake he will work it out did y'all hear me I said for God's own sake he will work it out now say yeah say yeah hey 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 A stable bow. That's what we as parents are to be in their childhood and as adults, a stable bow. I want to do something here today. I want us to practice what I just preached. I want you all to go with me on this, musicians. Go, go, go with me on this. Right now, I want to call for a parental altar call. I want all the parents in here, whether they're minors or adults, I want you to come down to the altar right now. And I want you to tell God, give them more grace. They're struggling in school. They say they got mental health issues. They want to put them on medication and you don't know what you should do. His father's unstable. He wants them for the summer and you don't know if that's good. They into some stuff that's got you greatly concerned. You can't stop thinking about it. Because it's the greatest love you'll ever have for your children. So I want us to practice what we need to practice day in and day out. Your job will never be done. And this may be the most important part. Everything you worry about, think about by day and dream about by night. That plays out in your psyche as a nightmare. When you consider the worst, I want you to consider God's availability right now. I want each one of you, say out loud your children's name. Say out loud your children's name. Call their name before God. Shout it upward to God. Y'all play for me in the background. Lord, won't you bless my family? I love them so much you gave them to me. Lord, won't you bless my family? Bless them, everyone, the old and the young. Life will have begun when you bless my family. Let's go to God in prayer. God, today, you've heard your people cry out the names of their ultimate concerns in this life. That which they've loved in ways that they cannot even put into words. That which they would without thought die for, their, our children. And Lord, we need you to know that we know they're not ours. They're yours. You made them. They were thought first carried on your mind because you had a have a purpose for them. You've called us to steward 
these precious arrows. To be the stable blow, bow that you can use to fling them far and wide at the mark that you have set for their lives. To not get in your way, to not be brittle and break. The arrow ends up ditched into the ground short of its mark. God, we want to be the stable bow that you can trust and entrust with your arrows that they can hit their mark. We need to be the thing that we hope to see in them. Make us better. Make us better. Help us to stand more uprightly. Help us to be consistent with our message. Help our example to be aligned with the precept. God, give us patience when we want to see changes come more quickly. Steady us, God, when fear begins to drive us, when we're afraid of what we think may happen, could happen. Steady us, for you give us not the spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and of sound mind. A frightened bow is not a stable bow. It's a reactionary and an overreactionary bow. Help us to trust you even in this. So that we can be the reliable source of wisdom. Source of advice that they're open to. We've not browbeat them. We've not stressed them. We've not worried them. We just stand at the ready. Give us that grace. When the instructing is over, but the consulting goes on and the covering is constant. God, let us be faithful in the work of keeping their name before you. We may call your name and call theirs in constant repetition. By day and by night. Father! Give them more grace. When they don't even know they need it or don't think they need it. Father, give them more grace. Grace to see better. Grace to want better. Grace to be honest. Grace to do better. Father, if you have to, put a stone in the road. Father, if you have to appear in dreams, appear in dreams. Father, do what you do. Go into the lion's den. Go in the furnaces of fire. Open up them red seas. Drown the enemies that are too close to our children. But they're your arrows, which is the bow. Help us be stable bows. You can use to fling your arrows to their mark. And in God, when they like us come around, and we say like our parents said of us, the Lord did it. We gonna give you all the praise. When the trouble is behind and joy bells are ringing and we gonna say the Lord did it. He can do it. When it's all worked out, when deliverance has come, when the night is over and the dawning breaks, we'll say the Lord was a watchman through the night who brings joy in the morning. The Lord did it and we will thank you. We will thank you with a thousand tongues, we'll thank you. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Say amen. amen. Now hug another parent. Say keep on praying. My family. I love them so much. I love them so much. You gave them to me. You gave them to me. Lord, won't you bless them? My family. My family. 
Bless them, everyone. Bless them, everyone. The old and the young. The old and the young. New life will have begun. New life will have begun. When you bless my family. Everybody stand to your feet, Lord. Won't you bless my family? I love them so much. I love them so much. You gave them to me. You gave them to me. Lord, won't you bless? Lord, won't you bless my family? My family. Bless them, everyone. Bless them, everyone. The old and the young. The old and the young. New life will have begun. Doors of church are open. Can you bless my family? Say it one more time, Lord. Lord won't you doors bless of church are open. If you're out there in the digital sphere and you need a church home, hit that button. How do I, I become a member? So much. If you're in here and you don't have you a church home, you've been away from the church, come on back. Extend to us the hand of fellowship. Lord, you've never been baptized in the name of Jesus. I invite you to come. Bless them, everyone. Bless them, everyone. The old and the young. The old and the young. New life will have begun. New life will have begun. When you bless my family. When you bless my family. Say it one more time. Say it one more time. Lord. Lord, won't you bless my family. We're singing a prayer. Bless them, everyone. I love them. So you gave them to me. You gave them Whosoever to will, me. whosoever will, Lord. Lord, won't you bless my family? My family. Bless them, everyone. Please bless them, everyone. The old and the young. The old and the young. New life will have begun. New life will have begun. When you bless my family. When Bless them, everyone. Please bless them, everyone. The old and the young. The old and the young. New life will have begun. New life will have begun. When you bless my family. When you bless my family. Bless them, everyone. Please bless them, everyone. The old down to the young. The old and the young. New life will have begun. New life will have begun. When you bless my family. When you bless my family. One more time. Bless them, everyone. Please bless them, everyone. The old and the young. The old and the young. New life, new life. New life will have begun. When you bless. When you bless my family. Come on, somebody give God a praise offering.